Hi, as uh, my first attendance at Roscon, so um, I didn't quite know how to pitch this. So I'm kind of fingers crossed it'll be appropriate for the audience. Um, do we have anybody here who's actually worked with Ascending Technologies quadrators before? Ah, good. Okay, great. Um, if you if you part of the MAV tools package or something like that, I'm sorry, I've I've largely ignored a lot of that. So I would really like to integrate it in. Um, so we should definitely talk afterwards. So I'm part of a project called Complex. Um, it's an EU project which really looks to to coordinate um, multiple agents um, to achieve some complex task. And the way it kind of tries to do that. Um, is by bringing together uh, guys from theory, so people in stochastic optimal control, um, also in reinforcement learning and uh, in bandits, um, and then sort of wed them with engineers and, and uh, in an attempt to try and, and get interesting things happening with cool robots. So uh, I'm sort of the glue that sticks uh, bits of theory onto quadrotors to see if we can achieve something interesting. Um, and today I'm going to talk largely at a high level about my sort of adventure in the last year because I've only really been working with Ross and even these quadrotors for the last year um, and how I've kind of moved from, from theory through to simulation experiments and how Ross has fit into the whole picture. <coughs> so I think I'm preaching to a choir here, but um, experiments, as we all know, are time and risk, and especially in the context of quadrotors and outdoor experiments with quadrotors. Something goes wrong, you lose a platform. It falls out the sky not really happy days for anyone. So, and even more importantly is that it, it presents a safety concern. So you have to be very careful when you work with these things, um, especially if you're part of an EU-funded project or something that's, you know, derives money or, or sorry, gets money from uh, um, the government in some capacity. Uh, so one of the biggest sort of first steps my predecessor made before I joined the Complex project was to develop a, a nice quadrotor simulator. And you have to bear in mind that the simulator was not necessarily targeted at um, roboticists per se, but at um, sort of uh, guys from, from a theoretical background. So it was in MATLAB and it was something that would allow a very deterministic system and then they could add controlled noise in along the way. And the features of this, this simulator, which is called QRSIM, uh, which um, is actually appearing in IROS a couple of years after it really started being developed. So that'll be presenting later this week. Um, the features of the simulator is essentially has a, a dynamic model for, for an ascending technologies platform, uh, particularly the Pelican. Uh, it was, the, the dynamics was actually uh, learned through evolutionary programming. We had a control input and state output, and then we learned this, this, the uh, algorithmic structures that essentially connected the two together. And uh, retrospectively looked at these, um, these formulae and went, oh, well, that expl is explained by some underlying physical phenomenon. And so we cherry picked out the stuff that was just overfitting for our particular uh, model that we used. And then we had constant parameters in this model that we could then fit to subsequent platforms that may differ in weight or slightly different mechanically. So um, you could take this, this dynamic model and apply it to, to other platforms um, you know, with the, uh, by just doing fitting effectively. Um, importantly, especially with outdoor uh, quadrotors, you've got a, a lot of noise that gets injected into the system from various um, sources. And I've divided largely into environmental noise and sensor noise. Uh, environmental noise is, is like uh, what the ionosphere and troposphere do to pseudo ranges in you know, uh, global positioning systems, or how it perturbs your, bar your barometric pressure sensor and, and hence your height, est height estimate. Uh, whereas sensor noise is, is like local white noise um, added into particular sensors because of just uh, you know, various sources like um, uh, quantization and uh, limited accuracy and mechanical noise. Um, so we had the simulator, we could essentially uh, simulate um, barometric pressure, uh, global positioning system, accelerometers, gyroscopes, all the kind of building blocks that would make a, a, a decent quadrotor. Um, and we released it to our project, and uh, they came back after a few hackathons with some issues, um, one of which was performance, uh, and particularly in MATLAB, if you wanted to render a nice scene, which everybody wants to, to check out what was going on, uh, you, it's basically n equals one was how many quadrotors you could have, which is obviously doesn't not a particularly appealing for people working in a, a multi-platform um, project. So you had to run headless in that case, and it was it, it caused a few issues. So what we decided to do, and this was about a year ago, was take all the bits and pieces that we'd we'd worked in in the actual QRSIM simulator, and we'd move them across to a ROS gazebo framework. Um, and this turned out to be a really great idea for more than just our original reasons. Um, and this is a, a, a bit of a, a complicated diagram, which I hope you can mostly read. Um, 
the neat idea with moving things and uh, to a ross gazebo framework was the fact that you can actually abstract away from your underlying device. Now, you have to bear in mind that I'm, although I want to actually get it running on a platform at the end of the day, my goal is to satisfy the needs of, of those in, you know, sort of more theoretical background. And they're not really interested in the bits and pieces that make up a quadrotor. They just want to issue 2D velocities and get a result back. So the way I decided to deal with this um, or in coupled with the fact that we've got to be able to move from simulation to experiments, because ultimately we wanted to run them on the platforms themselves. I, I introduced this notion of a hardware abstraction layer for my, my quadrotor. So I said, I made the, the bold assumption that all quadrotors um, must offer a certain set of topics and services. And, you know, for example, uh, a state estimate, the current control that you're sending to the flight control system, and a truthful position if you're in simulation. Um, and then you can essentially send it waypoint commands, velocity commands, velocity and height commands, angles commands, the kind of nice abstractions away from the underlying details of the quadrotors, which is what ultimately the, uh, the theory guys would work with. And so I created this system where um, effectively, if you look in the center right, the high level controller, which is the kind of path integral approach or whatever multi-agent coordination approach was, was being used, would essentially communicate with entities um, in a platform agnostic way. So they just see a quadrotor on the, MOS, the, the ROS um, messaging system and interact with it in that way. And that was a, that was a really cool uh, way to sort of get around the problem of having to then port code to a real quadrotor, which then would introduce, you know, um, uh, uh, an opportunity to, to like get bugs or errors. So, so yeah, this, this worked pretty well. Um, and one of the cool things that we added into the latest version was a really nice uh, GNSS uh, model so a, a GPS model, effectively. Um, it turns out that GPS is, is quite important to uh, quadrotor stabilization outside. You, you may have noticed where you, where you get all these fantastic videos with quadrotors flipping and balancing poles and stuff. There's a motion capture system behind it, feeding it essentially control information at 100 hertz, so it knows it's like millimeter precision posi position all the time. Outdoors, you, you don't really have that, that luxury, so you have to kind of work with the, the noise that you get. And, it's really important in simulation to have an understanding of what that noise actually is. And so we have quite an advanced uh, GPS simulator that actually simulates the satellite trajectories um, and uh, effectively, well, it simulates the satellite trajectories by drawing traces from the IGS um, service. So you can get ephemerides, which are satellite trajectories, satellite clock errors, um, and then you can synthetically create receiver clock errors as well as ionospheric and tropospheric errors um, based on various models. So Ultimately, you can, you can synthetically generate um, the time-correlated error that you would expect uh, from your GPS module, um, which will give you an understanding of how, how close your quadrotors get, even if you think you're not, um, they're not going to collide uh, because of the error in your position, you can work out, well, actually they may, um, by just repeating lots of simulations with um, these noise factors turned on effectively. So this is like a view of crates. And I've called it crates. It's got a fancy acronym, and I kind of regret calling this topic, uh, this actual presentation, crates, because it's a it's a really long phrase. But this is what it looks like. There's a quadrotor in the world. Um, what you see in the background is actually I'm using Gazebo 4 and Ross Indigo. Um, it's uh, I don't know if you, a lot of you may have, may have played around with it, but it has the support for for uh, geospatial data now, so you can add a a satellite image and a depth image, and together it can create a wonderful terrain view in Gazebo, which is, which is really useful. Um, it gives us an idea, you know, contextually of how our experiment's gonna behave. And I'll give a demo later if I have a little bit of time of this. Um, so moving from simulation now, I've gotta move on to, to the, the platform itself. Uh, I know there are a few who've, who've dealt with um, Pelicans before, um, but a Pelican is essentially a quadrotor. Obviously, controls achieved by varying your electric motor speeds. Um, there's some limitations, maximum 20 minutes. When you add payload, it drops quite quickly down to 10. Um, it's got a few constraints on motion, so five meters a second, 200 degrees a second, your rate. Uh, it's you know, just over half a kilogram of a payload. And one of the really important limitations, um, I'm sorry, that, that 10 hertz should be 20 hertz, my mistake, uh, is measurements and control can only be accessed from their stock firmware uh, at between 10 hertz, well, if you want to jointly get measurements and issue control at between 10 and 20 hertz, otherwise um, the system kind of breaks down. So you have to be very careful to, to stay within that range. Um, and I wasn't permitted to fa uh, flash, reflash the firmware. Um, they've got a secondary process, uh, processor which you can use and you can run things a lot faster if you've looked at the MAV tools projects. Um, I wasn't permitted to do that, so I had to work within the sort of constraints of what the system had for me. 
Um, and then we also added actually a uh, two gigahertz fit PC onto the bottom of our quad rotor, significantly adding weight, but allowing us to essentially run the whole um, ROS stack on it. Um, it's running Ubuntu, sort of a, a server version of it. Now, we also retrofitted the uh, uh, helicopter with a uh, couple other, sorry, the quad rotor with a couple other things. First of which was like, this is like a kill switch for a quad rotor. So um, we don't trust black box systems. So the ascending technologies platforms aren't open source, they're proprietary. So you can't really poke around at their low level controllers. So we wanted a way to cut the power from it mid flight in case there was a problem. Um, I know that seems a bit extreme, but we've got a high speed railway that runs past or relatively near our testing facility. So we wanted an ultimate last line of defense. Um, and m in addition to that, we also have a, a safety layer in the actual um, the hardware abstraction layer, which um, prevents the UAV from moving into a state that's that's kind of unacceptable, like turning your your uh, rotors off while you're basically in mid-flight. Um, and there's a, a, a sort of finite state model that's that that governs that. I'm not going to go through it, but um, it really helps with with keeping things under control and then rejecting control that's that's going to cause any particular problem. Uh, we also added a really uh, accurate um, GPS module. So this one does raw GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo. Um, and we can essentially get down to decimeter resolution to kind of ground truth our experiments, um, which is obviously useful if you want to go back and look at what really happened, because uh, your estimate, of course, from the quadrotor itself is perturbed by the time-correlated error that comes from the U-Blocks chipset, which is on board. We, can't re we don't really have control of that. Uh, the results from some quick experiments by looking at what our raw GPS came out versus what um, the quadrator itself thought its position was, was a mean error of about two meters of what it should be. Um, and where you see those sudden spikes is actually not uh, an error with the onboard GPS, but it's a cycle slip. It's got to do with um, when you do uh, raw GPS processing, you've got to track a carrier, the, the, carrier's, uh, the signal carrier rather than the code that's being modulated on it. And periodically, you, you come out of alignment. So this was all done in real time. This isn't post process uh, we were doing real-time um, sort of kinematic tracking of the uh, platform. And so you get these periodic spikes, but you can see it converges quite quickly back to um, what it should be. And that was an interesting sort of exercise in, in getting RTK Libra up and running alongside ROS on, on the platform. So putting it all together, here's sort of an overview of the architecture. Um, I'm not going to go again into it too much, but we've got the flight safety modules. They've got a Zigbee radio on board, and they send out heartbeats. And if the heartbeat's ever lost, after a certain amount of time, power's cut to the platform. So if it moves too far away from a base station, if the base station power gets cut, somehow it loses communication. The default is to just kill itself rather than you know, fly over a train track or anything. And that's very much, again, a last line of defense. Uh, we have two positioning modules on. If you look at the bottom, the quad, that's the quad rotor, which is highlighted like in slightly light orange. Um, one is the raw uh, GPS, which is the NVO8C, and the other one is the U-blocks, which comes with the helicopter, or the quad rotor, sorry. Um, and yeah, you can see at, uh, there's a, a, a four serial to USB module, which one of which goes into the actual single board computer, which then connects over Wi-Fi to our ground station. Um, we had some interesting experiences running um, multi-master ROS over Wi-Fi. Um, which, were, which were interesting, and I'll come to that a little bit later. So there were lots of <laughs> interesting mechanical issues on the way. Uh, ba basically, when you, when you load up a quad rotor up to its threshold limit, um, you start to see interesting failures, one of which is a propeller fa <laughs> fatigue failure. So mid-flight, we just lose the propeller arbitrarily, and it turns out they just had a structural pro like integrity problem, so we had to upgrade to um, a different grade of antenna, uh, sorry, of propeller, which worked really, really well in comparison. We also found that the um, stock platform, when you loaded it up with a bit more weight, when it landed uh, rather aggressively, it, it legs, its legs would snap arbitrarily. Um, even, even in its actual, um, uh, within its payload, uh, sort of the, one, the payload which it's been designed. So we had to add our own uh, CNC, our own reinforcement um, layer to the bottom to give it a little bit more rigidity. Um, so, the last thing I want to really talk about the hardware is um, the, the flight control system. I mentioned it was a, a black box. Um, so the two yellow regions at the back are effectively what we believe to be running on the flight control system. So two control loops, both at one kilohertz. Um, one essentially taking roll rate, pitch rate, yaw rate, and thrust, and then converting them to um, motor speeds on the right. And the way it does that is obviously by periodically fusing its gyro magnet um, magnetometer and accelerometer together to get an orientation. And it's got some sort of PID control loop that runs in there. And then we've got another control loop that 
uh, sits around that and then converts desired roll pitch um, and your rates to roll rates. So uh, that, that is essentially what it allows you to interact or what we interact with. So we, we supply it actual angles and not angular rates. And so we have to, it, we have to make sure that, that our dynamic model and simulation reasonably reflects what is happening in those two yellow regions, and we believe it, it to a large extent does. Um, and the bottom loop is what we run as our, as our controller. We have effectively a number of, of PID controllers that uh, allow you to supply, as I mentioned, waypoints, um, 2D velocities, 3D velocities, or angles, and then it essentially um, takes all the measurements together uh, in some navigation engine, produces a state vector, uh, we then look at our desired goal, and then we have a PID controller that finds some control and then sends that through to the platform at 15 hertz. And that seems to work reasonably well, um, although we, we spent a lot of time having to debug coordinate frames. Um, they seem to have largely unusual coordinate frames internally, and so we had to look very carefully at the way the state changed in order to make sure we had the correct east, north, up, right hand um, coordinate system and everything. That was that finally, after two weeks or so of debugging, we, we managed to get that working. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is the actual theory component, and this will be very quick because I know that's not, I'm not going to go into any real depth, but um, this is sort of echoes a little bit of what happened in the, in the last presentation with the, uh, um, I forget, was it D, DMC local, local, yeah, doesn't matter. But basically, we, the, the guys who I'm working with at uh, uh, University of Rackboat in Nijmegen in the, in the Netherlands, they're working on this path integral control technique. And the general idea is to do a um, forward propagation of your state uh, your joint state of all your, your quadrotors um, over a, a large range of controls. Um, so if you do 10,000 samples, and then you do some, some optimal sampling um, on that, the kind of collection of states that you have, in order, or, or the collection of trajectories that you have in order to work out which one's the most favorable. The difference being here that it's for, for multiple quadrotors at once. And uh, you define some sort of cost that says, I don't want them to collide, um, uh, I want them to keep within some velocity range, some non-zero velocity range, or I want them to be close to a, a target waypoint. And the cool thing is that this, this approach runs in real time, so it's recomputed over every new state arrives, and it's relatively high performance. It can, it can scale up to at least, we've tested on five quadrotors and m more in actually in simulation. Sorry, I've two, two in actual experiments, but we've had five in, in our simulation and it scaled up more in the previous framework. We currently, this is very much a work in progress for us. And the way we, we want to experiment um, with this particular theory is, is actually to do a, a a holding pattern sort of scenario. So say you have congestion at a particular landing point, you're trying to land in, in platforms. Um, they have to maintain a safe distance or try and minimize the distance between uh, themselves and the landing point in 2D. They can't collide with each other and they must maintain a minimum velocity. And then obviously you have your, your list of costs. So in five, it's a pretty predictable pattern with the origin being at the, the, the um, center. And you would expect maybe as you scale up, this is what happens. Now, I must tell you that this is actually what happens internally in the PI controller. There's a different representation. It doesn't actually use the full dynamics model that we have. It just uses a point mass. Um, when you scale it up to a few more, you get a little bit more interesting behavior. You have essentially a two-tier system with some rotating on the inside periodically, some rotating on the outside. And as you scale it up even more, you get even in more interesting patterns emerging. And these, are, these aren't intuitive sort of patterns that you could expect to, to, to find deterministically or analytically. You'd, you'd, um, you just have to kind of observe, given your particular problem setting, what emerges based on the control um, architecture that you're using. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip uh, the demo until the end. But what I do want to show is uh, we have two quadrotors here. This was at the Royal Veterinary College in London. Um, and what we were doing is we were running path integral control on both of them, so they both took off autonomously, and then they're running in real time over a Wi-Fi link, you're calculating a joint state and working out optimal control uh, for them, and they're essentially, they're, they're taking over from this point. So they've, they've chosen this um, circular pattern opposing one another from the origin, which is directly below them. Uh, and it was surprisingly a lot of work to get to this point, and lost a platform or two in the process. <laughs> But it was nonetheless uh, an educational experience. Um, and it was great to finally get an experimental result. And the key thing is that the actual code that controls this is obviously running over an entire ROS architecture. And it would be ex the exact same code would interact with the simulated entity. So there's, there's no change to the controller between the two. And that's hugely advantageous for us because when we have the guys in theory producing these wonderful um, you know, you know, control algorithms, we want to be able to try and take them directly from their simulations into a real experiment. So now that I have just a little bit more time, I'll, I'll just show you quickly crates, hopefully, in action. 
Uh, hope it works. This is always risky running something in real time. Right, so this is Royal Veterinary College, LiDAR image, you know, RG, RGB, XYZ, the usual. Uh, then we can uh, use our PI controller to instantiate some UAVs in this world. You see, they get spawned and then they get bopped into the ground. They disappear because of the difference between the collision and the actual um, rendered mesh. Um, and then, this is the actual PI control algorithm running on them. So this is running obviously over Ross Gazebo. I don't know what happened there. Obviously when there's a demo, there's a problem. <laughs> One of them, I think, seems to have bailed there. I don't know, maybe because of recent changes to my code. But the, 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 other, the others are actually coordinating their actions um, according to the PI control mechanism. So that's kind of a, a, a cool demo of what, what we've been up to, really. So, uh, right, so that, that's the end of it. Um, thank you uh, so much for listening. I've, I've added a, a few more points just to kind of discuss um, at the end, uh, just issues that I encountered along the way that it would be nice to chat about. I don't know what uh, I can go back to start the current slide. Basically, some questions about ROS was that uh, I noticed that ROS topic and ROS service on the command line in Indigo seem to have about a one second latency. Um, whereas if you actually use them in C++, we seem to get instantly. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that, if that's normal behavior. Um, but we, we spent a lot of time debugging our, our um, wireless uh, chain to make sure that we weren't uh, doing anything wrong and that we seem to encounter that. Uh, we also wondered if there's any value in maybe with this whole um, hardware abstraction layer, if there's any value in having the idea of message inheritance. So if you have some rigid body defined as a base type and then you can extend it to be a quadrotor and then add thrust um, as a potential value and state. I don't know if anybody's talked about message inheritance or if that's something that's on the cards. Uh, obviously, I'd love to know if Multimaster plans to get integrated into ROS core, if it's, start, if it's going to actually become something that is part of the stock distribution. Um, and then so I'd be interested to know if anything's been happening with quality of service guarantees, because um, obviously I'm issuing control over the network. If we're having camera frames being dumped simultaneously on the ROS network or, or the ROS backbone, is there going to be problems with control? And how do we guarantee that, that certain um, messages get delivered above others or get dropped off the queue? Maybe there's an existing solution. Again, I'm new to it. I'm happy to, happy to get uh, suggestions from anybody who has an idea that, of you know, what's a good approach for this. Um, but yeah, I've only got about a, a minute, uh, two minutes left, so I'm happy to, to answer some questions um, or just chat offline if you'd like to. Thank you. Oh, sure, sure. Do you have the hardware that'll do raw? Okay, good, cool. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to talk through that offline if you want to, no problem. So what's, what yeah. is the uh, initiating the dynamic quadrotor? What's, what's the, I mean, you know, Gazebo is a rigid body uh, simulation. What's the most important phenomena that you need to capture or have a reasonable model of the, the dynamics of these two? Um, oh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I can tell you how we do it. So I, I, my predecessor, Renzo, he was actually came from a quadrotor background, so he, he did the actual fitting and the evolution of programming to get this dynamic model. Um, what we do is we essentially, in every time tick of physics in the simulator, we've changed it down to 50 milliseconds because that's really what we consider, an, uh, sorry, 20 milliseconds as a, an acceptable discrete time tick for us. Um, we essentially look at the state of the quadrotor and then we um, update uh, its uh, roll, pitch, uh, yaw, and throttle component, and then we write those di forces, resultant forces directly, uh, based on the control input, um, as forces directly in gazebo that affect the rigid body. So we, we consider it a rigid body. We don't actually worry about the aerodynamics or the propellers and, and everything down to that level. Yeah. It may have. That's why I noticed the overlap with the kind of sampling over the next time window, and um, it's kind of a stochastic approach to controlling. So there may very well be good overlap between the two. So I can definitely, I, again, I'm the, I'm, I'm sort of the, um, the glue that fits everything together. I, I can definitely put the PI control guys in touch with the guys in navigation, see if there's overlap there. Yeah. 
Uh, MATLAB, well, the, it was really important early on in our workflow when we actually were developing the simulator because it's really good for rapid prototyping. Um, so all our, our noise models uh, and our dynamics models were originally all um, coded up there and tested. And then we eventually just ported them to C++ for performance reasons. Yeah, we migrated eventually to it. Um, we do have, well, yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the way I should end it there. We can talk offline if you want to about other stuff, future things. Cool, thank you.